You're listening to Rod and Style Radio, the latest podcast brought to you by RodandStyle.com, which is where you can find links for merch, videos from our YouTube channel, along with stories and tech talk from some of the greatest folks in the culture. So grab the wheel, it's about to get wild. You've tuned in to Rod and Style. Welcome to another episode of Rod and Style Radio. Hi. You like my you like my radio voice? I love doing that voice. He does, like he doesn't even <laughs> notice yeah. that he does it until we all pointed it out. It's like, no, you turn on the minute it goes on camera. <laughs> like it it's one of those things. It, as soon as I have a microphone in front of me, like I I think that I'm hitting the stage once Didn't again. You have a very good radio voice. <laughs> I, I I'm really told do. this. I don't even listen to the podcast. Neither I do don't. I. <laughs> <laughs> we just have fun bullshit. <laughs> People are like, remember when we no, talked I about it. that? I, I totally get it. Like, I, I did a podcast uh, probably four or five years ago for the local newspaper, and I had so much fun doing it. I was like, am I really conceited or do I just like talking about myself that much? Oh, it's a wonderful <laughs> thing. I just had fun doing it. <laughs> it is a wonderful thing. I've been invited onto other podcasts and I've taken over their whole show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, thanks for having me on. It's like, it was just you. All right. Sounds good. If we have no <laughs> usable content whatsoever. Uh, I don't I, know what to tell you. you. Know, I learned from the best, Courtney Hanson, how to take it over. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Glad glad to hear something. I was like, ooh. <laughs> but speaking of episodes, y'all just had an episode come out, and I got Good. to learn about your parents and how they met. And I was telling Lane about it because he was trying to catch up, and I was like, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I know. I was watching it in the truck driving home. <laughs> Probably not the greatest thing, folks. Uh, if you have the Motor Trend app, don't watch it while you're driving home. D- wait till you get home. <laughs> but it was so good. It. Like, I hate to say it, but my best part was every time you got on because I was like, I know him. I was like, I got to meet him. I was so excited. So uh, I got- now you're making me blush a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, like, the cool thing about that is my parents did not meet around cars. So my dad was like local expert motocross racer. And it's kind of funny, like I've been around Oklahoma City long enough that you kind of sit around and think like, how long did some of these people that I know that are in their seventies and eighties, how long have they actually known each other or maybe didn't know each other like hang out like they knew of each other because this guy had a hot rod at this cruise and this guy was over on this side and this guy had a motorcycle and, you know because my both sides of my family have been in oklahoma city one side since the early 1900s like and even earlier than that in the land run in 1889 um, part of it and then on the Cook side, they came in the mid early forties. So like the fifties, I can't throw a stick and I don't know somebody that's somebody in the fifties at Oklahoma city, mm-hmm. like the transmission man that I use for cars. No, he was a teenager in the fifties. He had a cool car that everybody still talks about. We built him a car similar to it, but modernized it. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I can tell you a car that you guys know. You know the red 55 Chevy that that guy, Cody, has? He's out of, like, Illinois, and it's uh, he restored an old custom, and it's a 55 Chevrolet. I it's believe got, like, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, that car was originally built in Oklahoma City. I've seen the building that it was built in. The dude's best friend is like a grandpa to me. That's the Max Baker I'm talking about. Wow. Like, oh, wow. 
So how this relates to my parents is Max Baker knew my grandpa. My dad raced with his oldest son. How my mom comes into this is they were all friends with another couple that the daughter introduced my parents. The mom of that daughter had a beauty shop with my mom's mom. Wow. Everybody and they just all raced, They it. all had motocross in this. They all met in Venita, Oklahoma, which is up by Starbird's house. And at one time was the world's largest McDonald's. It spanned all the way over the highway. Oh, wow. If you're going from Tulsa to Joplin, you drive under the McDonald's. Oh. So they met there, headed to Missouri to this big race. Well, the Fannins introduced Cooks and Burton Staten, however you want us to call that. Um, then um, damn it, Brian Dunning <laughs> sending me stuff on the internet. <laughs> so anyway, so we get they get there and my step grandpa steals the sign to the track. <laughs> Nobody knows about this. <laughs> They all parked together. My dad and his buddies asked my mom if she wants to go into town to have dinner. And she said, yes. Well, they get lost. They can't find a track. So according to my uncle, they pull up on some house party. And this is in like 78, 79. So like there's some good house partying going on in nowhere, Missouri. <laughs> and... So they stay a little longer, according to my uncle, than they probably should have. <laughs> they finally get back to the track because the people's like, oh, yeah, that track's just right over there. They pull in with a van that my dad took with his buddies into town. That was the van that my grandparents and my dad and two uncles were going to be, like, camping out of. So now it's like late as shit at night. They're supposed to race the next day. My grandparents pissed. <laughs> oh, no. Time goes on. My parents start dating. Uh, my mom had a 46 Ford that she drove in high school. It's the 46 Ford that you know of my dad's car with Rob hood on it with the stacks. Mm -hmm. So when she drove it, it wasn't lowered and it had uh, chrome reverse wheels with baby moons. And it had a dual speed rear end. And it was a four speed with a small block. Well, wow. they, she wrecked it in high school. <laughs> and got another body. Met my dad. My dad was kind of getting out of motocross because he had bad knees and stuff. So they, she took my dad to his first ever car show. My dad's like, oh, I could do that. He'd already painted a car in my grandparents' garage. <laughs> Which is a funny story about that is you can't think about the air conditioning. <laughs> so he painted the garage when they're out of town and it blew paint All the on the house. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. But he used to paint his dirt bike tanks because they were metal and he custom painted his helmets and his brother's helmets and stuff like that. So my dad gets hurt real bad. Mom goes to see him in the hospital. They start, he had like a knee surgery or something. Time goes on, they end up getting married, building this car. By the time I'm three or four, they're drag racing it. My mom always wanted to race. It's a little backstory, and there's, there's a scratch in the back window of the car. Mm -hmm. It's from, like, wild club trips. Not my mom, but some of her friends like to use the back seat of you know, 46 Ford's got a comfortable ass back seat. I know. <laughs> I've slept back there a lot as a little kid. But... <laughs> no, but like, so that whole deal goes on and they drag race a little bit. My grandpa Cook actually wrecks the car drag racing. So they decide, okay, this is taking too much money. But you're going to backtrack just a little bit because my grandpa 
Staten, my mom's dad, he bought the car in 71 and built it and then gave it to my mom to drive in high school. Mm -hmm. Wow. And how cool is that? That is really cool. It'd be like, oh, here's your first car. Yeah, here's your first car. 1946 Ford Coupe, four-speed, and a chick's driving it. Like, I've seen my mom in high school. I would not have probably chased my mom in high school. (laughs) But that she had that car, I would have been like, Hey, what's up? <laughs> oh, yeah. 100%. My mom always yeah. tells the story of her, you know, when she drove in high school. Of course, it was in the early 60s. I'm going to get, I'm going to throw my mom under the bus a little I bit. I know. <laughs> oh, God. The, in the early 60s, and my grandfather, he owned a plumbing business. Uh, with a little bit of the money he made off of that plumbing business, he bought her a, a 57 Chevy and then yeah. painted it in their driveway purple. Because that's the color she wanted. That She wanted a purple <laughs> car, so she got it. So, yeah, that's really cool. Find out somebody else's mom had cool cars, too. Oh, uh, My mom had, like, badass Camaros and all kinds of stuff. Like, she was she's pretty calm now. <laughs> but, yeah. And she was the one that, like, brought you into all this stuff, right? About learning about cars and working on them and stuff? Well, Honestly, no one person did in my mm-hmm. family. So I'm a fourth generation hot runner. Mm-hmm. We're a car person, period. Uh, we can pick whichever side you want to. On the cook side, my great grandpa had a salvage yard down in the flats, which is like post depression camp area. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they moved to Oklahoma City, they lived in a pallet house. Then they moved to a trailer house, but it was like right off the river. I-40 pretty much covered it now, but uh, he had a defunct salvage yard that he would pull cars in, scrap them out, sell the metal and the cotton and all that. Like, my grandpa told me stories of having cars come in, and it was his job to get all the cotton out of the seats. And this is when he was, like, 10 years old. So he could take all the cotton with these so this would probably be 48, 9, very post World War II. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's not, it's not the fabulous 50s we know yet. It's still, you know, if you're in Oklahoma City, it's still poor. Oh, absolutely. We're still coming out of the Dust Bowl. We're still coming out of World War II. Like, so he got to sell the cotton, and he's he's the oldest of his generation my dad's the oldest of his i'm the oldest of mine so he's selling cotton he remembers taking like kids to stores and or he took kids to school because he was the oldest in the class well the local store burnt down so once all the kids got into school he was like 10 he ran back to the store and reached through the wood floor because it was charred and he could break it and got all the change that had fallen through the wood floor. And he's like, oh, I wow. was rich for a little while. <laughs> he was rich. <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of what I grew up around. You yeah. Know? And then, um, so then my grandpa cook was a hot rider. He drag raced in the 60s, had a 57 gasser that he welded the spindles together and uh, got second at an NHRA regional here in Oklahoma City. Uh, he's currently building a car that looks a lot like the car that beat him. Oh, cool. Which is a 61 Impala. Uh, this happened in 62, but it was a 61 Impala. It had a 348 in it that he took out, which I now own, but uh, it was a 32, 348 four speed car. But we actually took spindles and welded them so he could show me how to do that and how to cut and measure everything. We got him one degree off, so it's a little off. But we got him about half inch too tall. Like it sets like this. <laughs> now, like, oh. But it was it was a cool learning experience, you know. Like because I begged him for shit like fifteen years to show me how to do this. He finally did, and I was like, I don't care if it's off. I just want spindles. I'm hanging <laughs> on the wall. Right. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted so, the experience. I wanted the fun. Exactly. So anyway, he was in the drag race. He got into motocross, little early 70s motocross stuff. 
he's got a trophy from uh, over 30 class. That's when my dad and his brothers were getting into it. And that's kind of where that it kind of progressed from there. Mm -hmm. Now, on my mom's side, it's actually like even crazier. So, my mom's grandpa was one of the original members, like the founding members of the Oklahoma Horse Horse Carriage Club. I have magazines of the Horse Horse Carriage Club Gazette from, I think, 1954 and 55, and it has him with some of his old brass era cars. And wow. one of them, oh. I know y'all have seen the picture of my car yeah. with all the girls on the hood. So I didn't know anything about that when I took that picture. I get this magazine for Christmas from my great uncle. He goes, I want you to have this, your great grandma's in it. And I find him. And I don't know what, I don't remember what the car is, but it's some old touring car in the 20s. And it's just piled full of chicks on it. And I'm like, yeah, that's my grandpa. <laughs> So we see where you get it from. <laughs> yeah, and then like my grandpa, he was, and this is even more where I get stuff. When he was like 12 or 13, he took the local trolley thing to Norman, Oklahoma, from Oklahoma City, and stayed too late. Well, next thing you know, he's in like New Mexico on a ranch trying to figure out how to get home. and. <laughs> I mean, he's like 12 years old, you know, and he pulled it off. He, once he got old enough to have, like, motorcycles and stuff, he had this triumph. And he would actually do the whole uh, Indian landing, riding on the seat with his arm, you know, the Iron Cross deal. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 On this bridge that's right by his old house. And uh, the dude was a hero till he died. Like, really was. Mm -hmm. He passed away not long ago, but with a little bit of time that we had to put him in a nursing home, when he first got there, he was so not about it. <laughs> he was losing it. We all know it. So he would be real calm about it. And like his fourth day in there, he just took a chair, threw it through the window, climbed out, and they caught him just running down the street. <laughs> and I'm like, where are you going? He's like, I'm going home to get my car. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Uh... Uh, the the Indian in uh, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest when he just breaks the window yeah, he, and runs. He did, he did not care, dude. Like, <laughs> my whole life he was that way. He drove a Chop Top 36 Ford pickup. Or, no, 36 Chevrolet pickup. And I mean, he drove the wheels off of it. He built it in about 74 or 5. And probably drove it up until about 2013. I mean, and he's not a short guy. Like, I'm the only short person in my family. He's like six foot three, driving this little chop top truck, and he'd have ladders and bullshit and Sad. metal and trailers. And he wrecked <laughs> it so many times, like the front fenders are just bondoed up. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, it's awesome. I can't I can't point my finger any closer. Like how are you gonna tell me that he's six four and he got this tiny little truck, this little rat rod truck, and he looks like fucking Dino from fucking Flintstones when he pops his head out, like just looking at the lights because he can't see. Yeah, I and, couldn't see out of the But then yet thing. I'm the no, one so my grandpa <laughs> I mean it's a closed cab pickup and he would just sit there and I remember he'd like all lean over. <laughs> And I don't know how he knew. I think he just guessed. <laughs> I think you can see the lights this way. Because he would whole shot shit out of everybody. It'd be like, one the, guy, the dude drove like 100 mile an hour everywhere he went. <laughs> Sounds like Todd. Like, he did not care. <laughs> Laws did not apply to Gene's statement. <laughs> so that's why sometimes people, like, they kind of hang out with me and they're like, oh, like, you know this isn't how it's supposed to go. And I'm like, so I'll make it work. So I'll make it city. Work. I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the that's the part of the family that we can blame to uh, 
reasons why uh, the evil midget showed up in places <laughs> like Nashville, Tennessee. It's like, how do you end up out there working on shit? <laughs> Dude, Nashville is cool. And it was crazy because, like, on the TV show, that was the first time I'd ever been to Nashville. So, you know, we've been up for three days finishing that car and then get to Nashville. I'm like, aren't you tired? And I'm like, I'm in Nashville. Like, I'm, I'm in the house George Jones built. I'm going to go see some shit, dude. It, it, goddamn right. <laughs> so, Will, the guy that got me on the show, that's kind of the head designer. Mm-hmm. But not, he, is, he owns Big Oak Garage. <laughs> he goes, hey, man, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to skip all the stuff we want to go see because we just we can't do it right now. I'm like, dude, I get it. He goes, I'm going to take you to Lucille's. I'm like, all right, what is it? He goes, little bitty ass hole in the wall bar. Cool. He goes, it's COVID. We're on a TV show, so we can't be around a lot of people. All right, I get it. I mean, this is the most dead I've ever seen Nashville. It was <laughs> June, June, like, 28th of 2020. They just opened it back up. Oh, so we go upstairs because Lucille's has double mm-hmm. levels. And I don't remember the name of the band. I wish I did because they were awesome. And especially for how tired and just relieved to see something I like going on, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, especially with all the times that were going on, the TV show, BS. Like, damn, my buddy like knows what I like. And this band was awesome. And it was like a rockabilly, psychobilly band. Like, every song they played, I think it was just because I was just so delirious. It was like seeing Jerry Lee Lewis in person. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, Years like, later, you find out they were just doing Tom Jones covers the whole time. And uh, you were just yeah, that I remember tired. them being good. I just can't remember the name of the band. Like, I remember... Like, the name that comes to my mind, I know it's not the name of the band, but it was real similar. Mm-hmm. And so I don't want to say the wrong name because I know it's not. The, the name I'm thinking of is a band that's kind of semi-local. And it, it's not them, but it's real close to that. But they were just good. My buddy Will will remember because, A, he wasn't as drunk as I was. And B, like... He actually kind of had seen them two or three times. Hmm. And I only heard of them. I had never seen them. But man, that's what people don't realize is there's still a big segregation of bands for the area you're in. Mm-hmm. You know, like out in the Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee area, some Florida. There's great bands out there that I've seen the name, but I've never heard of because they don't come to Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's bands in California that I've seen, and I was just lucky enough to see them. And every once in a while, we're coming this way. Same as if you go up north, you know, like, and people are like, no, you know, radio killed off. No, it didn't. I mean, there's even country bands that they're more modern country, mm-hmm. but they sound a lot older than they are. And I'd never heard of them until I went out and spent two years out east. And it's like, dude, I thought real country music died. No, it didn't. You just don't hear it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When I was playing it music, did in this area right now, kind of. Yeah. yeah. When uh, when I was playing a music uh, a bunch, you know, fifteen close to twenty years ago now, uh, a lot of bands that would come through town. Yeah, everybody I talked to said that Texas was uh, one of those places where you had to tour the whole state and then you didn't get to go anywhere else because Texas is so damn big. <laughs> so everybody would, yeah, everybody, especially if you were going to come into San Antonio because we're like dead in the middle of Texas. So you might as well hit all the rest of them while you're headed this way, you know? I've never actually been to San Antonio. I've been to Austin. 
Of course, Dallas, Fort Worth, that's not far. Well, sir, now you have a house that if you ever want to come down here, you are more than welcome to stay. We need. I'm down. You could be I'm the down. you could be the first one because we at the last house we never we had people stay over, but like the house was really small. You got this whole ass living room. That's kind of how my apartment is. It's a one bedroom apartment, and I got a futon. I'm like, if anybody's coming through Oklahoma City and wants to crash, I'll show you around. And they're like. Dude, we gotta listen to you snoring in the other room. I'm like, shut up to be drunk enough. You won't care. <laughs> you won't care. Exactly. exactly. That's this one. Uh, I'm not the snore. He's, I'm like, you know what? Just let me fall asleep before you. I don't give a shit after that. I'm ready to me, sleep. <laughs> me and the six year old, we we have contests to I see who can snore. I fucking hate it. It's him. No, there was when I when we first started dating. She was like two and three, so she would sleep next to me. I would be the one in the middle, and he would be on the other side. She'd be in one ear snoring, and then he would be in the other. <laughs> And I was like, I'm in hell. I'm just going to die. I'm not going to sleep. And they're like, I slept great. How would you sleep? And I'm fucking all red-eyed, looking miserable. <laughs> well, so I snored a little bit when I was younger. Then I got hit with a hockey stick in the nose playing street hockey. In like a roughly high school, early high school age. Before it healed. I was jacking around at my great grandma's house with this stupid exercise thing. And it was like this bike thing that you like pulled the handlebars and pushed your feet. It was weird. It was basically showing you how to practice for something other than the stationary bike thing. Like, I was like, wow, my great grandma rides this. I wonder where all that practice came from. No wonder you have four kids. But I was looking at it, and I was like, I wonder what this handle does. And I pulled it, and I didn't know it was to collapse it down while I was sitting on it. So the <laughs> handlebars, and my nose had just been broke, like, maybe a week before. And the handlebars just fell right back on it. And I was like, yeah, I almost passed out. Like, it hurt. <laughs> oh, my God, that sounds horrible. <laughs> and she laughs her ass off. <laughs> Because I can just imagine this. You know, no, you're, yeah. you're like, what it does this do? Bam. Wow, neat. This is weird, but whatever. He's like, it works you out. I'm like, what are what this handle does? I'm like, you sit on the seat looking down, and I pull it, and the bars just go bam. And I'm like, ah. Like, I fell off of it. I'm rolling around the floor. My mom's like, what's the matter? And I can't even talk. It was like, it's hard. <laughs> oh, so then man. years go by. That, that started my snoring. Then years go by, and my cousin and I flip a van. <laughs> of course, we're chasing chicks. Been out racing motorcycles. One mo we had free money because we won money racing motorcycles. Terrible idea to go to the bar after you win money. Because. There it all goes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you don't care. You're on such an adrenaline high that you don't realize just how buzzed up you are. Yep. So we, we end up. Luckily, they changed the little intersection thing. But we roll the span. And when we do, I actually fly out the window and end up in the highway. <laughs> oh, my up, God. I'm like, damn, dude, he's laying over me and he's just crying. And I'm like, why are, what's going on? And he's like, you're dead. And I'm like, I'm not dead. It's just, <laughs> why is it so cold in here? And he's like, you're outside. And I'm like, not in my room. And he's like, no, look around. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm almost in the highway. And he's like, you're bleeding to death. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I have this big scar opinion. And what happened was when I did all of that, I broke a sinus cavity that like <laughs> runs way up here. So yeah, I smell like a train now. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. God damn. Yeah. Oh I've trust me, I've had some beauty shit happen. And this is not doing the stunts. This is just everyday life. This. Yeah, we haven't even gotten into the evil people stunt. Yeah, so how did you get started with that? He got hit in the nose. He got hit in the nose. Yeah. It's like, I can uh, do this. Hang on just a second. Give me one second. 
Okay. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Rod and Style is brought to you by Work Hard, Be Nice. Yeah. And Martin's Rods and Customs. And Maybe. Bad Idea Customs. And Messenger Custom Paint. I had to go get more beer. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> so, how I got into the Knievel stuff. Honestly, by Evil Knievel's death. I remember, I remember the day he died, um, which actually was my cousin's birthday. And at the time, my only adult girl cousin's birthday, November 30th, and it was 2007. By 2008, I was doing stunts. So I had met Sugar Gum. Before this, and it was all through Monster Garage mm -hmm. that I met him. Mm -hmm. Not directly, but I had a promoter here in town with an old man transmission guy mm -hmm. that I said had a son that raced with my dad. Yeah. Okay, he's a promoter here in Oklahoma City that used to have a record store, and now he does all kinds of stuff. Well, he used to have a bike rally that he did all the music at. And his buddy did the bike rally part, and they, I had just been on Monster Garage, and they invited me to be celebrity guest at the bike rally. So I meet my buddy, Trigger Gum, and Seth Innsworth. And I don't know how much you're into, like, Crusty Demons of Dirt stuff in the 90s and early 2000s. Well, they were big in that mm -hmm. video, you know, Freestyle Motocross, when it was first coming out. Seth was the one that jumped over the house on... Um, with a house and the airplane on MTV, and one of them, he flat landed, and the whole front of the bike blew apart, and he has like a scar all the way across his head. Mm. Well, anyway, Trigger at that time held the world record for the longest motorcycle jump, 277 feet. But he did it in Australia, which is where Crusty Demons originated, mm -hmm. just to have Night of the Records. Well, he wanted to bring it to America, and he knew Evil Knievel. And Evil was all about it. And just, this is how you do it. This is what you do. He got him in touch with Wide World Sports, which wasn't called that anymore, but it was just, I mean, mm -hmm. it was on USA Today. It was all over the place. For a motorcycle jump in 2006, five or six, it was a big deal to have it on the front page of the paper. Right. Well, he ended up crashing. And in typical evil form, he actually got up and walked to the uh, ambulance and waved to the crowd, but he had like five or seven broken vertebrae. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. So I had basically met this guy's three or four months beforehand, then, like, did all the whole, um, like, measuring the wind and speeds he was going and angles. And if you want to jump a motorcycle real far, I'm not really good at math, but I'm really good at telling you if we can make it or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because what you don't know is you need your flag really high in the air. Because when you jump, what people don't realize is what the wind speed on the ground is. It's actually different about 50 to 60 feet in the air. It, so that's almost, how you... it can actually change directions. Huh. It could be blowing one way where you're standing mm -hmm. and be blowing a totally different direction. And it may only be a little bit, but it'll be enough to like so once you jump so far, once you jump about 200 feet to 250 feet, you're actually flying the motorcycle with your arms. Just moving your elbows will turn the bike. Oh, wow. It, it's insane. Yeah. No, I, I stay on the ground most I, of the I, time. He doesn't, yeah. like, he doesn't like being in the air. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do on a motorcycle. I do not. If I'm just standing on like a platform, I don't, no, I'm scared of heights. But 
you know, I, man, well, I'll get into that in a minute. Let's just say I've done a really long jump, and it was pretty cool. <laughs> or, but it was still cool. So I watch him do all this. Everybody goes home because they're all from California. This happened in Miami, Oklahoma. It made world news. Like, I was literally, like, in my hotel room in tears watching the world news. Like, I just killed a buddy of mine. Like, this sucks. Mm. Yeah. Then I found out he was okay, and I was like, all right, cool. So everybody else had to fly home because they already had flights booked. Well, I didn't. I drove. So I stuck around, and it meant so much to him and his wife that I stuck around. We just became really close friends. Later on, he did a jump. It was like 250 feet. It wasn't like crazy, crazy far for the ramp setup we had. But I had to light him on fire to do it. And that's actually on YouTube. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the whole deal was it was like, hey, you need to hit me in the back while I wear this towel thing that me and Spanky Spangler made. And like strapped it to some vest that he had on. It was crazy. <laughs> so he's like, hit me with it. So I hired my little brother. He's like 17 at the time. I'm 27. <laughs> and he, we poured race gas on it, sort of light real quick. <laughs> well, instead of like just hitting him, I wanted him to fill it. I hit him like as hard as I could because I was like, I don't want him to be like sitting there like on fire. So I like hit him and he just looks at me and he's like, damn, dude, as he takes off. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> so he takes off and he does jump. Well, in the video on YouTube, we've been partying a whole bunch and some, this is like little bitty town, and some random guy had a limo there. Robert De Niro rode in one time. So I had like a picture of Robert De Niro stuck in it, <laughs> which we made and like, we don't care. <laughs> so <laughs> we had all these chicks and all this crazy stuff happens. The only reason I'm even telling this story is nobody can get on the trigger because he passed away like three months ago. Mm -hmm. I miss that dude. I always miss that guy. Mm. I, me and him had some times upon times. Like, that guy got me into more stuff that was more fun. Probably shouldn't do, but we did it. Like, <laughs> it was more fun than legal. Oh, uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I've got story. I could go on for a whole nother podcast about your stuff he and I did. <laughs> we'll, we'll have we'll have Mike on once a month for us. Exactly. Uh, I the need, Mike and Trigger show. Yes, I need, hey, yeah. Mike and Trigger, Mike and Matt and Mike Jones, Mike and uh, <laughs> Will Posey, Mike and this guy. Mike, uh, oh, fuck it. We'll just have the Mike show. The Mike show. <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> so we do all the still and he, he gets done. And I have a black eye in this whole video from this chick punching me in the eye. Oh my God. So at the time, I'd always heard of U.S. bombs and all these cool punk guys. Yeah. Come to find out, Trigger grew up with Dwayne Peters. Oh. So Dwayne Peters sent me, like, shoes and shirts and all this cool. Dude, because of Trigger, I didn't buy clothes or shoes for like five years. Yeah, because he had uh, Vision Streetwear. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I had a so, I had a couple pairs of those. Oh, so that's so awesome. Lost energy, lost energy. The uh, street clothes version. Mm -hmm. They sponsored me for a lot of years. Draven shoes. They sponsored me. Vision, Alpine Star gave me motocross boots. Moto Option, I met them later on, just kind of on my own. They sponsored me. Like, there was a, like a 10 year span of my life from about 26 to almost 36 that I didn't buy clothes. Like, I just wore what people sent to me. And then I would just get to pick out, like, circle. I would print out pages off the website 
because I was too lazy to do it the way they told me. <laughs> too old school. And I would just circle it and then send them a picture and be like, send me this. That's so awesome. That's how I feel about black t-shirts right now. Uh, I have a closet yeah. just full of t-shirts. You never so. know which one you like, get. It's, it's <laughs> odd that I have a gray shirt on today, but I was like, I'm going to do body work all day. It blends. You know, yeah. like t-shirts that are clean or like shirts kind of white. Oh, wait. Here's this plain gray one that I gave to. I could burn it and I don't care. <laughs> so my dad's like, why didn't you want me to get gray t-shirts if you have a gray t-shirt on? And I'm like, I don't work in your shirts, dad. I'm like, I will if you give me enough of them. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> so... Then, during that whole fire jump, Trigger had to do an interview or something. And to kind of be like Mr. Rockstar, he throws me his phone and he goes, you're going to be my PA guy. You're going to answer my phone. I'm like, okay. And I look at it and it says, Robert Evil Knievel. And I'm like, Sure, you don't want to answer this. He goes, You're about to talk to Evil Knievel. Answer the phone. So I did. And I'm like, This is Trigger's phone, Mike Cook speaking. And he's like, Where's Trigger? And I'm like, uh, Robert, he's walking up on stage to do a press conference for that jump on fire that he's doing there. I'm helping him with uh, Spanky's next to me. He goes, Number one. I don't give a shit who you are. And you ever call me Robert again, I'm going to drive to wherever you're at and whoop your ass. (laughs) Yes, sir, Mr. Knievel. I will never call you that again. And he goes, I am Evil Knievel and you will address me as Evil Knievel. And I'm like, yes, sir, Evil Knievel. And he goes, you don't trigger to call me. Click. And I just looked at Trigger's phone and I was like, "Uh, as you know, call Evil back. (laughs) <laughs> and he goes, why are you grinning so big? And I'm like, dude, I just got cussed out by Evil Knievel. This is one of the greatest days of my life. <laughs> that is so wild. I don't, I don't know so, if I've gotten cussed out by anybody like that would be that cool. So, That's so wild. And what's really cool about it later is as time goes on evil dies people start trying to resurrect all that old school jumps well i was working the international fair expo for a freestyle show and i run into a guy named dr danger he's the one i did Mantra's got talent with Mm -hmm. he put on some shows whatever that he's yeah he's a mess Good guy, but a mess. So he puts on a show called American Daredevil All-Stars. And he's like, man, I want you to do something. But I know you can't really physically jump motorcycles. And I said, I can, but not far. Like, I actually jumped over the truck one time <laughs> before the snow was cool. Wow. So I got, I got lost to see me a shitload of clothes for all my crew. <laughs> and I convinced my cousin to bring it easy up. And we set it up inside the building where I did the jump. And it was like in the middle of a little short track and a little barn. What did I do? Whatever the tag said on the T-shirt, 50% off. You got a cool T-shirt. <laughs> so they offered me like 10 bucks. Dude, I made as much money on T-shirts that were given to me as I made doing the jump. <laughs> so I bought all my family's dinner. It was awesome. We Aww. party like king. <laughs> So he went, I, I'm like, man, I'm, he goes, can you ride through walls of fire? And I'm like, well, I have a Honda 50. I bet I could. And that's where all that started. Like, it was all because of Trigger. And we're sitting there getting ready to do the deal, and they build, like, two walls. And Spanky's like, listen, I'm going to go light him. And when I light him, you go. I'm like, all right. Well, I seen him moving his arm around while he was pouring gas on the stick. 
I was so nervous. I just went for it. <laughs> the wolves weren't even wet. I just blasted through him, and he's like, well, they went on fire, but he goes, if you wait till they're on fire, they hurt less. And I'm like, those didn't hurt at all. He goes, you're good. Is you afraid of fire? I said, not really. He goes, good. Don't listen to that other guy down there. There's this other guy that's like, listen, fire is going to fry in your face. And you're going to want to grab your helmet. And I'm like, I don't think so, dude. Like, I don't want to let go of this bike. It's going to hurt a lot more if I let go of this bike. <laughs> so I ended up doing five walls, and it ended up being on uh, CBS Sunday morning, actually. <laughs> Damn. Like, you know, like the little sun? Yes. They did a little deal about this show and evil dying and people coming back into it. And they showed me going through fire, and I was like, holy crap, like my first real Daredevil show besides... Well, hold on. I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> I had also done the MTV tribute to Evil Knievel, mm. where I did a backflip with Travis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Trigger Gum and I jumped 113 foot, and I broke my tailbone doing that. Ouch. Yeah, I wouldn't suggest it, but <laughs> I did it. And when Pastrana and I did the backflip, I got a spinal concussion. So that all happened, like, pretty much in the same day. Jesus. No, oh thank God. you. I have a sneeze and I'm out for a week. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine right. breaking shit. It's like, I'm calling to... into work today. <laughs> no, like, I had to call in for work. And basically, like, it was weird. I kind of laid around. But because Trigger had a hotel for, like, another week or so to do, like, little OTF stuff for the uh, MTV deal. So he would go do that. And basically, we would just party in the hotel room while I would just kick back on the couch because my back hurt real bad. And then after bet. a couple of days, I'm like, hey, I feel good. I'm going to go home. Wow, that is nuts, man. You have had some really cool people get to meet you over the over – these last several years man like travis pastrana that's a that's a big name right there when it comes to you know all of that so i didn't realize this until after i met after i really didn't meet after i hung out with him as we were older and did that like we're just kind of kicking back after they had filmed one day and he was like man you look familiar when we were like 12, 13, we were on a mini bike video called Moto Lab Rats. Oh, wow. And he's on it because, uh, so my family never stopped racing on my dad's side. Like, his brother still raced. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of his brothers still races some. Um, he rides Grandpa Expert or whatever it's called. But, uh, like, my one cousin just retired from being a professional motocrosser, and my other cousin, who rides the over 30, 35 class, kind of just for fun, just to stay in shape. And I still go to the track with him. And in the middle of all that Daredevil stuff, at one point in time in my life, when I wasn't working on cars for about, eight years or so, it was the same, about the same time I was doing the Daredevil thing, I was also traveling with a kid named Brett Welch and taking care of him for his dad and going to all these big nationals for amateur stuff. So, like, me and Ricky Carmichael, we partied it up in the tent at Loretta's for the amateur nationals singing Family Tradition. Oh, <laughs> so, that's awesome. Like, and then... In the middle of all of that, I met Mad Mike Jones. That's where my knuckle tattoos come from. Mm-hmm. I actually did that in his house. They look just like his <laughs> because I'm four foot tall and crazy. And he says, Mad Mike. Mine says, Mini Mad. Because <laughs> when he partied, we partied a whole lot the same, just as hard. Like it was basically head toward the brick wall shift all the gears and don't let up and you might make it through that brick wall or you might splatter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we got a 50, 50 shot I mean, right now. <laughs> that, that story is that, yeah, we're not on that podcast, but 
<laughs> it got pretty wild. We had a lot of fun. We really did. And we're still friends. Like, up until Trigger passed away, like, I would hear from him every once in a while. Mike, I still hear from him. He actually sent me a text the other day saying that he'd watched the TV show and was proud of me. And that, that's a guy that, when he was in his heyday of racing, that's when I was the little kid on the couch watching racing with my dad. Mm -hmm. Like, idolizing this dude. And then he would come to Oklahoma City and race every once in a while. And I'd be like, yeah. And then there's Guy Cooper that was Travis's kind of trainer, mentor guy that he was pro when I was a kid. And then helped train Travis. And, like, it's all just like a big circle realm of, kind of one of them deals everybody I've ever wanted to meet somehow I was in this right spot at the right place I met them all that's so cool yeah. they got to meet well, you that's what I said they got uh, to meet you damn it <laughs> <laughs> like we did I mean, not like even we, goes did. That we haven't even touched on the car side yet like that's hey, what's this... crazy. I've got like a whole nother deal about that like this is why we're going to do a part two, a part three, a part four, a five. Like, this is just fun. I'm it's fun talking that. with you. Yeah, no, this is fun. So, so then I started doing stunts. You know, I did that deal, and I started doing stunts and trying to book stunts. The deal with MTV, they had me come out for the 24 Hours of Jackass. That was when they debuted my tribute to Evil Knievel. And the cool thing about that is, you know, I've always wanted to be a professional motorcycle racer. That mm -hmm. was my original goal. Like when I was five years old, I want to be a pro motocrosser. Well, I'm four foot tall. It's not going to happen. So this was kind of my way of living out a childhood dream. Mm -hmm. I'm standing in a TRL studio. Like we're old enough to know what that is. Yeah. It's, She's Take heard of it. Hey, I, I knew you were going to say something. I <laughs> Shut up. I do know what it is. Ass. Anyway. She saw it on so VH1. So I'm in the middle of Times Square in MTV studio. <laughs> if you're old like me, it's GRL or whatever it's called. With, what was that guy's name? Uh, the host. It was Total Request Live with, oh, damn it. I could see his face, too. Oh I can too. <laughs> Glad y'all see anyway, the same man. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But so I'm in there and Jackass is taking this still over for 24 hours and then they play my video and I'm on a couch, Knoxville, all this stuff. Well, they get to playing it and I'm like, can I walk over that window? And they're like, yeah, I just don't get right on the edge. I'm like, all right, cool. And I have a picture somewhere of me pointing at the Jumbotron in Times Square, and I'm on the Jumbotron. Oh, wow. And there's like people looking up at me, like looking back and forth and like waving and like, yeah. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> this is cool. Like, it wasn't Kurt Loader. Kurt Loader did the, uh, the news. Oh, man, I can't think of who it was. Man, but that is so damn cool. You've even Carson let. Carson Daly? Probably and Carson I Daly, yeah. Carson Daly, yeah. So, wonderful. Like at that point, I'm not even 30 years old yet. I'm like, dude, I'm gonna be the next biggest thing since Cheetos, dude. I'm in. <laughs> no, like as soon as that was over, it's like you go home and you push sandpaper, and you do swim pool work, whatever, and you're like, crap. I'm like, oh, so much for that. You know? It was that and one I fleeting a contract moment. with an agent, did all this stuff that didn't amount to all beans. <laughs> I didn't have to buy clothes for a year and I made extra money. So I was like, this is cool. You know? That's pretty much how we came about all this. We were like, oh, let's just see what happens. And then people were like, oh, here's some shirts. Come to these shows. And it's like, man, this is cool. And then we got to go back to our jobs on Monday. And we're like, fuck, I want to do that instead. I call it the car show hangover. Like it was well, badass weekend. And then Monday comes and you're back to, you know, square one. Yep. I'm still trying to figure out a way to make money and watch the TV show. Yeah. I mean, if like, we could figure that one out. five more episodes left until they take a break and then show the last four. So if I can figure out a way to 
have somebody pay me to watch my own show with my friends. Yeah. That's like the coolest concept ever. It has to be. I think I think we can totally make that happen. We can start uh, promoting it to bars and be like, we can have Mike show up at your bar for the low, low price of, and then we'll come up with a, a astronomical number. Exactly. Because this is the same well, guy that least, is led. Like, basically, if I just make my normal paycheck a week, like, I'm good. Like, cool. <laughs> I went to the bar and drank one day this week and did exactly what I could have done. Or sweet, <laughs> I'll still go to work. I'll still go. <laughs> but I mean, we're talking about the same guy that lets Brian Lee Dunning share a stage with him. Man, this is Mike Cook we're talking about. Like, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> I broke him. I broke him. You did. You broke me on that. That's funny. Oh man. I think no, no. meeting you, that was one of our, our uh, favorite moments of meeting you was you showed up at the, the Oki Sledge show and just immediately grabbed the microphone away from Brian and started singing. It was great. I'm going to I'm gonna totally throw you under the bus. He was fangirling so hard when he saw you. And he's <laughs> I like, I don't want to. He's like, I don't want to go say hi. I was like, go fucking say hi to him. And he's like, I, I can't. I can't. I can't say hi. I was like, he's right there. Go. <laughs> <laughs> That, I will tell you this, that's how I've met all the people I've met, is I have no, there is no, I'm not good enough, to, no, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I was that way when I met Billy Gibbons, I'm not gonna lie, and I've met him like two or three times. Oh, that's so cool. The The third time I met him, yeah, it was no whole bar, but I was also, I should have stayed in my seat and not talked to him, probably, but I did. <laughs> So, I mean, hey, I was on cloud nine at the banquet at Grand National Register show, and he's sitting right in front of me, like, how could you not be like, hey, Billy, what's going on? You remember, like, hanging out with me at Monster Garage? Yeah. Yeah, so in the middle of all that, I also did Monster Garage with Jesse James twice. Man, that is so cool. Like, I didn't realize that, that and I had watched stuff. Monster Garage. I didn't, yeah, I didn't so realize that. I actually that. did Monster Garage before I ever did any stunts. Oh. Like, I did Monster Garage when I was 20. I filmed the first one when I was 23, the second one when I was 24, because they happened, like, two months apart, and it just so happened my birthday was in the middle. Mm -hmm. So... Then they aired in May of 2005. I, yeah, 2005. No, 2006, because I turned 25. Because that was the year I quit working for my dad. Got a job at a tool store that sucked. The only cool thing is there were hot chicks there. I never worked around chicks, so <laughs> don't guess where that went. That, that went on its own little trail, but <laughs> hey, it went from like sitting in a hot shop with your dad and a bunch of buddies standing on the baddest cars in the world to being like, well, I'm in an air-conditioned building selling tools and man, that chick's pretty cute. That chick's cute. And <laughs> next thing you know, it's like, Mike, you're not allowed to talk to them anymore. You have to kind of stay over here like what do you mean? And they're like, well, you don't sell tools anymore. Like, well, I don't I don't have to. I have that peon and that peon and sell the tool. <laughs> and they're like, you're not the manager. And I'm yeah. like, well, I manage you pretty damn good, don't I? There you go. There you go. That's how you get your way up the ladder, man. That absolutely. Manipulating other people. To become, like manager, and I was like, no, because I'll be out of here as soon as I find something cool. <laughs> <laughs> I tell them and that every been, day at work, and then they still think that I'm going to show back up. And <laughs> there I am, working away. I'm lucky. I'm somewhere so cool. I don't, you don't give a shit what I do as long as I just show up and clock out. <laughs> Like, bye. I'll be texting him. And I'm not going to throw out where I work, but I'll be texting him. I'm like, hey, we're at the bar right now. And he's like, what? I was like, yeah, it's only like noon, but it's fine. We're going to have some drinks. And then I'm like, we're going to go back to work. And then I'll call him again. I'm like, we didn't do any work. Yeah, they got a three drink minimum. <laughs> well, on you know lunch. what the problem is? He and I 
don't look like you. If we look like you, we'd be all over the damn place. Like, hell yeah. You're not lying. You are not no, lying. I'm not lying. <laughs> I mean, for everybody out there in the I, podcast world, I don't look like my wife. No. <laughs> I, I, I would kind of be terrified if you did. <laughs> Y'all have never seen what I look like, but I, it's not like her. I mean, you know, if I had, like, a very successful company, I'd be like, hey, you can just clock in and out. I just, just hang out in the office. Be cool. We'll go have beers. Here She's the only reason Chuck lets us do a podcast. I'm going to tell you that right <laughs> now. I'm, I, yeah. Mike knows it. He knows it. <laughs> y'all are crazy. But, oh, my God. Y'all are funny. So, like, and then, so getting back on the track of the whole Daredevil thing, like, I did that. For a while, I was on American Daredevils. At one time, I held the most, like, the biggest record of Walls of Fire, 21. Wow. I did America's Got Talent, jumped the bus into other buses, all this uh, crash going through eight Walls of Fire because we set them up kind of crooked because we had to. Got in an argument with Howie Mandel. <laughs> Hell yeah. Did he do the Bobby voice? That would have been hilarious. Yeah, we got, he would just like, your bike was small, your jump was small, this was small. And I'm like, well, here's a helmet. You go do it, dude. Yeah, it's like, okay. <laughs> Mike's right over there. I'll warm it up for you. <laughs> Shout out to Howie Mandel. Yeah, suck We it. still got the tell, helmet and the bike. This. I will tell you this, that... Uh, uh, like to, have you been to the Grand National Register show, Pomona and all we that? We have not. We're actually planning on okay. making it this next year. I know. I should be there. Yay! Awesome. Trust me, it, it is. I love going to all these shows. That one is so much different. Because there's the inside. It's like having all my life of hot rodding combined into one show. Mm-hmm. You know, there's customs, low riders, high end hot rides, the whole AMBR deal going on. Now, Bob, that has LRP, has like these booths that you can hang out in if you've got a car in all that. And, you know, my dad's an LRP dealer and all that. So it's like, holy crap, this is cool. You know? That's wild. Like, that's one thing that I'm really, really grateful for. It's not only do I know, like, side of the world that I met you guys through of just traditional old school hot rods but I can still call Bobby Alloway and Troy Japanio on their personal cell phones and be like hey what are you guys doing today you know like that's a big gap yeah Yeah. and it it was very hard to bridge that gap but I did it you know, my dad used to make fun of me, but now he's like, no, I see it. Okay, I get it now. Mm. You know, it was more of a culture thing than just the cars. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Like, because my dad, and you know, that's just how the nature of the beast works is with the shop that we have. Every car, it really stands what you do every day. Mm-hmm. So you can't just throw something together and drive around. Now you can with your personal car, but not for a customer, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, kind of like the 51 Ford that I just posted the other day. Like, that's just a driver car, but he's still got a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's what the dude wanted. He came to my dad for a reason. He, I think he kind of went farther than my dad went a little farther than he wanted, but that's my dad putting his name on it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, that car will be around long after us. Like, you know, like. Yeah, that's absolutely wild. I mean, you know, there's a lot of that that goes into, you know, building cars that some shops don't have that. You know, that they, it's, there's people out there that they, you know, they think they're going to open up a shop and they're going to do big and great things. But there's that need of being completely connected to saying that I built this, I'm putting my name on this. And, 
you know, it's not about, oh, we're going to come out big with this one build and, you know, every, you know, mm-hmm. everybody's going to know our name. And it's like, no, like everybody knows your name because you put out good things. Every car is just as big as the next one that comes in. Yeah. That's my dad tells me that constantly. Oh. And I get that. <laughs> that. That was part of my biggest thing. That was a hardship for me mm-hmm. on the P show. I've done Monster Garage. You want me to build a car in 30 days? <sighs> no problem. Now, the fenders might be welded on and shit might be hanging off, but it'll get down the street. Or do you want a nice car built? And then, you know, don't hold me back because all you're going to do is frustrate me because you put me on a mission. Mm-hmm. When I'm on a mission, I'm on a mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was kind of why when you see the show and I get frustrated, that's what it's all about is it, it, there's a fine line and you, not everybody knows those fine lines, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, you really have to have really been in it. Not necessarily in the car world, but just, you know, like y'all having your own cars and your houses and trying to fix them up how you want them. Mm-hmm. Like, you realize the frustration with just, okay, I budgeted for this much. Well, it always goes up the budget. Yep. We all know that. Every time. I don't care if it's going to buy beer. You end up, if you train up beer, you go over budget. You know? <laughs> I was only going to drink a six pack this Friday, but I was having fun with Brian Lee Dunning. Next thing you know, I drank an 18 pack while I went over budget. I mean, that, and, it's, and it's not really, I just use that as an example because. It's, you get to have a fun and you yeah. get to enjoy it. And then, you know, and cars, houses, whatever, like, it's an extension of you. Mm-hmm. And you want to put all your effort into it if you want to do it the best you can. Like, I don't care if it's a rat rod or just a traditional custom, traditional hot rod, a race car, it doesn't matter. Like, if you're passionate about it, you will do everything you can to do the best you can that day to that car. Yep. Yep. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's, I think the crazier part about it to tie all that stuff together is that, you know, with having the Buick and having this house and stuff like that, like we've gotten to such a point in our life that we want to have the nice things that we love and decorate the house and have the mid-century house and have guests over and have people come hang out with us and stay with us and not worry about all that and be like, hey, you want to jump in a car? Let's go somewhere and eat. You want to come hang out and record with us? Come fucking do it. We have the space now. Mm -hmm. So that's like this 51 Ford Victoria. Is it going to be, you know, good guys, customer of the year, customer of the year? No. Is it going to win Salina? No. Is it going to win anything? We don't care. The guy sought out to build a car Mm -hmm. to drive. That's Mm -hmm. all he wanted. He wanted to be able to drive it anywhere. He's 82 years old. And his owner, he's always wanted 51 Ford. Mm. He even told us if he would have known the extent of work that we would put into it to make it the car it is, that he would have done it 10 years ago so that he could enjoy it more. Oh, It's wow. got a fat man chassis. It's got a coyote motor. It's got 10-speed automatic transmission, decoded digital gauges, a backup camera, a CB radio, a it's like got every possible little doodad. It is hoard out in chrome. <laughs> it's got every piece of 51 Ford chrome you can put on it. <laughs> and it's hot ass candy apple red. Ooh. It's got two and a half inch boiler stainless exhaust. I mean, like, you rack on it, it racks the pipes like a beast. Like, And it's funny because it's still got that little bit of a pop, like a glass pack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Except it sounds like it's trying to blow flames, not just have that old glass back pop. <laughs> I mean, it's a 500 horsepower car in a 51 Ford that sets two inches lower than stock with white wall tires on it. 500 horses. God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he, you said he's 82? 82. And he's it's ripping on it, stock. too. I'm sure he is. It, it's got a restored steering wheel on it. 
Uh -huh. But it's got, a, we mounted it to a flaming river column with all the good dude that, I mean it. It's got Mustang tube, full suspension, coilover, right jet coilover, it, everything. Like it's, if you and I could be like, I want to build this drive anywhere I want to go at any time as fast as I want to drive it, that'd be the car. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like it has everything in it. Uh, God it, bless. I, mean, I can't even imagine the, a, the the parts list that, it, that you know, he, when y'all started having to order all of that. <laughs> so, God the bless. weird thing between the TV show and my dad is I don't order 900 things at a time like I had to do on the right, TV right. show. The sponsor wanted one part twist, and you got one shot to get it all. And I'm like, that's impossible, dude. And yeah, I can't like, even no, imagine that kind of a... Production was like, no, that's how it works. And I'm like, no. I've <laughs> done this for 20 years. That's not how it works. Like, I'm sorry, but you're an idiot. <laughs> just at the end of the day. <laughs> just so you know. So... But, you know, it is something I did learn a lot from that TV show. Mm -hmm. So now, when we go into cars building it, we're going to do brake lines or fuel lines or water lines. And I know it has a bunch of AM fittings or special bins or special things. Like, I can actually draw the frame out now and set down and count and pregame in order maybe a handful of extra fittings in case because something's different than what I drew, you know, something in my head's different than how the car actually comes out. Right. With, you know, fenders or coolers or whatever. Like I can order almost all the coolant fittings at one time or all the brake fittings at one time. And that saves us a whole lot of time. Yeah. And it, it's just, it saves a lot in shipping. And oh, of course. Stuff. Absolutely. Whoa, shit, man. We, we've gone on for over an hour. It's because we have fun. Oh, we I like know. talking on here. I don't know. We haven't even so gotten awesome. to like a TV show or anything like that. It's <laughs> so awesome. We'll get to we'll get around to it at some point. Yeah, guys, y'all are gonna have to stay tuned for a part two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least to ten, ten episodes with the famous celebrity Mike. Yeah, Mike Cook <laughs> hanging out. Uh, you know, we really appreciate you being on the podcast. Uh, it was uh, Dude, absolutely time, our pleasure. I didn't even realize it's nine o'clock. I still thought it was like eight. <laughs> I, I thought it was like seven thirty. <laughs> And when the people who listen to this, because our podcast goes out every Monday morning, they're going to yeah. listen to this and be like, it's, it's nine o'clock? Shit. And they're, they're going to be trying to get home and drink their beer. And, <laughs> yeah. No. God bless. Yeah. Uh, but for real, man, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. And you are always welcome to come back. Yeah. You know, Rod and Style Dude, Radio needs to have know, you. Now that I got all this little deal set up, like... This is a hard you know. I could do this every Thursday for all I care until <laughs> we get the whole story done. Yeah, we can definitely have you on. Uh, we can we can have you on for several episodes, and then mm -hmm. we can always have you on for the for the updates for when the the new episodes for the TV show are coming. And then out. when you come here. And then when you come <laughs> here and record with us hey, in that person, that would be kind of cool. Like, do one. I see. I'm talking about some other podcast that i have listened to every once in a while you know they have actual guests at their deal so it, the phone interviews and zoom interviews all came about uh more uh it was always a thing but it came about more uh when covid happened and everybody right, had right, to right. be so yeah, remote yeah. uh but you know if, if if all of our friends were just local, we would just do right. podcasts all the time. No, I understand. But uh, one good thing about the new house, we are five minutes away from the airport. Yeah, so we can pick up anybody. Hell yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm literally like eight minutes from the airport at my apartment. There you Bam, go. There you go. 
There and I you literally go. work like 10 minutes away from this house, so I'm only 10 minutes away from the airport. Yeah, so, so you can show up in the middle of the week. I do have some guys in case you come up to the Starbird show. Yes. That's the plan. Okay. It hasn't been released yet, but a certain somebody with a certain blonde girl that are on TV together are going to be celebrity guests. Nice. Oh, we'll we'll let our guests uh, put two yeah, and two they'll, together they'll, on we'll that one. We'll let them figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, and then I know that Brian Lee Dunning's playing again, so like that's actually a whole kind of dream I never had come true. Yeah, I've actually been a celebrity guest at the Starbird show when I was on Monster Garage. Because one of them I did with Daryl and Gene Whitfield. Mm -hmm. And which that's a whole other story how me and Gene got into it. And <laughs> made it. But, <laughs> oh, so man. anyway, like it's kind of when I did that, that was so long ago that, you know, Daryl and Donna and Christy and mm -hmm. uh, Corey, they didn't know him, Brian yet. He really didn't go to the Tulsa show. But he started going at that time and played an after party that they showed up at, I think. And he played it not long after that. But so it's almost like I've been going to Starbird show since I was like nine years old. Damn. And now I'm getting to do stuff like this. And my yeah. best friend on stage downstairs. And I'm upstairs with all the big wig stuff doing my deal. And then getting to go downstairs and party with everybody. And it's like, wow. Like, yeah. You know, and then I got the Starbirds calling me personally just to see what I'm up to and stuff. Aww. And, it's like, and like, yeah, it kind of gives you that satisfaction of maybe I did do something right in life. Absolutely, man. That is you so did. cool. You did. I see so many people tag you in so many things with, regarding the show, regarding you being at shows. And it was just absolutely so much fun meeting you in person. And so I was like, when he told me he's like, he'll do it. I was like counting down the days. I was like, we're going to talk to him. I'm so excited. Like, you have no idea. This is probably one of our best interviews that we've had. Like, yeah, I so love much having fun, you for on. Sure. For sure. We'll have you on again. Because I still have... I still need to tell you the story of the big uh, lesson that Gene Winfield taught me. Mm -hmm. Not Gene Winfield, I'm sorry, that Bill Hines taught me. Yeah. Me and Gene getting into it, we, we've made up since. It's cool. <laughs> uh, just, I mean, dude, I've got some stories for you. Awesome. We'll, we'll definitely have you on for several of these episodes. But, uh, yeah. They, they will absolutely have to be all tagged, Evil Midget Approved. Yep. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> matter of fact, you need to text me the address and I'll send you some stickers. <laughs> Deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, folks. Hey, I'll tell you a fun game about the TV show real quick. Uh -huh. Oh, go for it. And, it. and it just came into my mind. So when you're watching it, you know, it took longer than normal to do because... COVID and parts and money and just, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of stuff. So, you know, I was in the movie that's about to come out called Killers of the Flower Moon with, it's a Martin Scorsese movie. So yeah. they shaved me. So I had no facial hair at one point. And I flew home, filmed it, and came back. So I go from sideburns like this real big sideburns because I stayed out there forever but still had the sideburns. Then came home, grew a beard because mm -hmm. I was over my 40th birthday because I thought I was going to be cool. Then, like, shaved the movie, then had sideburns again for a little bit. But also, if you look at my computer, it had two stickers on it. An Evil Midget Approved sticker and an Oki Sled sticker. As it moves on in time... It gets more and more stickers. And some of them get blurred out because, like, it can't be on TV. And so it's kind of, it jumps around a little bit. So you're like, if you look for little key things, you're like, damn it, Mike. You were supposed to be, like, a continuity person. 
you are the least continuative person I have ever met. <laughs> Well, folks, we have absolutely had a pleasure talking with Mike Cook. And as always, in all things custom, keep it cool.